Hi, I'm Drew Totten. I'm the clinical and nurse educator at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and also CAT TV's medical consultant. Although the Ebola crisis is no longer in the media on a daily basis, many people in West Africa continue to die. Today, we're going to discuss the problem in detail and give you the information that you'll need to answer any of your questions. Today's objectives are we're going to review the current facts about Ebola, we're going to dispel any myths about the virus, we're going to explain the transmission, the progression, and the symptoms of Ebola, and we're going to discuss SVHC's role and response to an actual incident. So for some history, Ebola is a virus. It is not a new virus by any stretch. It has actually been around since 1976. And most of what's going on today in the world is pretty much concentrated with, in uh, West Africa, in the areas of Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Mali. In West Africa, the climate is extremely tropical and humid, where temperatures range anywhere from 95 to 105 degrees on any given day. The Ebola virus, as I mentioned, has been around a long time. They believe that the source of this comes from fruit bats, which are contaminating other animals. Here's a graphic distributed by the World Health Organization that shows the areas affected. This graphic is effective January 4th of 2015. And as you can see, overall 21,000 people have been affected in the areas of West Africa and 8,200 people have died. Liberia has the greatest number of infected of 8,157 with 3,400 deaths. Sierra Leone has 9,700 infected and 2,900 deaths. And Guinea has 2,775 infected with 1,781 deaths. Africa is considered an at-risk population. There is poor sanitation. There is an extreme shortage of medical staff. For example, there are 135 medical doctors that are in that area at this time. And also, they are having difficulty replacing those physicians. And part of the reason is, is that most of the doctors from Doctors Without Borders are actually going over to, uh, to West Africa to volunteer their time. And in so doing, they're losing um, those two weeks from their practices and from their businesses. The other issue that comes across with this problem is the fact that they end up also losing three weeks because they are in quarantine once they, once they get back. So this has been a real problem in recruiting and keeping physicians over in West Africa. The population, as you can expect, has some limited education. And there are significant burial rituals that happen in Africa. So for example, when a person dies in, in West Africa, the body is bathed and they are shrouded and there's a tremendous amount of touching that goes on with their deceased loved one. And they are spreading the virus not only from each other, but also to their community. This is an example of a hospital in Liberia. As you can see, it is nothing like we would ever expect here in the US. You can see at the bottom of the screen that there is a person um, that is laying there with the green shirt on. He is there for medical care. This is an area behind that hospital that's known as the hot zone. And all these folks have Ebola. You'll also notice that they are cordoned off by some rudimentary type of fencing. And there's a little boy sitting in the middle of that group. Uh, his name is William. This is what William looks like. His father had Ebola, but was successfully treated. And unfortunately, William died some weeks later after this picture was taken. I say this not to tug at your heartstrings, but just to remind us all that we cannot lose our humanity just because these people are cotton in a way. There are people dying every single day in these areas, and we just need to remember that. This is a very common picture uh, as healthcare workers are removing the deceased uh, to other areas, in, uh, and this, this picture was taken in Guinea. The incubation period is 2 to 21 days after exposure to an infected person. And the quarantine for the virus is 21 days. Generally, symptoms will start between day 7 and day 9 after they are exposed. And here is a breakdown of what those, those days and those progression looks like. As you can see on day 7, there are headaches, fatigue, fever, and muscle soreness. On days 10, 11, and 12, the symptoms get far worse. 
generally in America, we would expect to see the patients in our healthcare facility somewhere between day seven and nine, because most Americans would never not get healthcare within those days 10, 11, and 12. And we were very, very sure that most people would go to the doctor and see their healthcare provider with a headache, fever, and muscle soreness long before they got to the other stage. Here are some truths about Ebola. The first truth is that it's difficult to catch. It is a blood and body fluid contact only illness. It is also, there's also what's known as a secondary infection. The secondary infection means that a person who has Ebola will spread it to two people. Conversely, people who have measles, that one person can spread that disease to 17 people. So with proper treatment and screening, this is a virus that we can certainly take care of. Ebola is contained with proper equipment and training, which all of us at SVMC and HC have been trained to take care of, which we'll talk about in a minute or two. Chlorine bleach will kill the virus. This is Thomas Duncan. As you may recall, Mr. Duncan was the first person to die in the U.S. from Ebola. He came uh, to this country. He was a resident of Liberia. He came to the uh, Texas Presbyterian Hospital in, on September 24th, and he was treated there for some uh, upper respiratory infection and some general flu-like symptoms, and he was then sent home. On September 28th, he returned back to the hospital much sicker. And on October 8th, Mr. Duncan died. One thing that is important to note is that despite what happened to Mr. Duncan, his family, although they lived with him and they were exposed to him, not one of them became ill. Here are the two nurses that treated Thomas Duncan at the Texas Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. It should be noted that the nurses were exposed to Mr. Duncan when he was the sickest, but nonetheless, both of these nurses recovered. The important facts of this illness is that the blood and body fluids, sweat, vomit, and feces must be come in direct contact with the body of another person, and that person needs to be infected at that time. The patient is only infectious when they're symptomatic. So what is SVHC doing about this? Well, for the last number of months, SVMC has been working with administrators and clinicians, and we've been meeting uh, every other day since September. And we have, um, our goal here is to screen and protect and transfer the patient from our facility if an incident should happen. This is just a screenshot of what we, of, of our webpage here at uh, SVHC. And if you notice in the middle of the screen, you'll notice there's an uh, Ebola preparedness link. That link is there for our staff to click on, and once they do, it will open up another page. Before we talk about that, however, it's important that you recognize, all of our patients recognize, that they're going to be screened when they come into our health system. They're going to be asked a maximum of three questions. And this is important because it helps protect you, our patients, our staff, and the community at large by doing so. And we would appreciate your patience and your understanding when this happens. This is another piece of the, the website uh, which shows our staff our protocols, all the guidelines that we need, and some of the links that are there for both um, Ebola and for the CDC. This is a very, very helpful page because it gives everybody, everyone in our organization the ability to find out the most current and detailed information possible. This is an example of our algorithm that is there for our patients if they should come into our medical practices, our laboratory, or our imaging department. So the first question we're going to ask, uh, ask our patient is, do they have a cough? And while um, a cough is not a sign of Ebola, it is, it is a sign of either flu or, or an upper respiratory illness. And it's important for us to be able to screen our patients for those. The next set of questions we're going to ask the patient is, is a travel question. Have they or any one of their household members traveled in the past 30 days to either Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, or Mali? This travel question is extremely important, and it's important because it makes the difference of whether or not the patient will rule in as an Ebola patient or rule out. If the answer is no to those two questions, then the patient will then just go and get registered as normal 
and everything will progress. The third set of questions that's asked the patient is do they have any of the following symptoms? Do they have a fever? Do they have headache or weakness? Do they have muscle pain or vomiting? If they have any of these other symptoms, including the cough, including the travel, they have just ruled in as a suspected Ebola patient. If they have ruled negatively, then again, the registration clerk or the clinical staff will then take care of them in normal fashion. As we mentioned, the patient will instruct, be instructed to wear a mask. The staff for the medical practice will then notify the emergency department, and they will let them know that they have a possible Ebola patient. At that point, the patient will be um, isolated in a, in a patient room, and they will wait for the ED uh, staff to arrive. Once they've done that, once the patient leaves, the patient will be taken to the emergency department for treatment, and I'll show you in a moment where the patient will go. And then the, our housekeeping uh, department will then take care of that room and decontaminate it. Some of you are probably uh, familiar with uh, these two patients and their, and their story. The first, the first person on the left is Peter Italia. And Peter was a, um, was a person who flew to West Africa from Rutland, Vermont. And Peter went to West Africa with the intention of helping under the guise of being a physician. He arrived in Guinea, West Africa. He was there by his own volition and said, I I'm here to help. And when he, when he came, um, they asked him for some credentials. Unfortunately, he had no credentials to, uh, to present, and he was then asked to leave and fly back to um, the U.S. At that point, he had contacted the Rutland Health Department and notified them that he would be coming back to Rutland, Vermont, via John uh, Fitzgerald Kennedy Airport in New York City. At that point, the health department sent a sheriff and a nurse who drove the five-hour trip and picked up Mr. Italia. Mr. Italia then uh, conceded to going through a 21-day quarantine and, and did so in Rutland. The person to the right, Casey Hickox, is a registered nurse who lives in Maine. And Casey had gone to West Africa, particularly to Sierra Leone, and provided care for her patients. At that point, she had come back from her two-week stint and, in West Africa and then flew back into Newark, New Jersey. When she, was, when she got back to Newark, she was stopped there and they had quarantined her. The difference between Ms. Hickok and Mr. Italia was that Ms. Hickok, of course, as I mentioned, is a nurse. And although she conceded to going to the 21-day quarantine, she did go back to Maine. But on, on day five or six, decided that she would go out and ride her bike in the community. As you might imagine, this instilled a fair amount of fear in that community. Nonetheless, both Peter Italia and Casey Hickox are uh, Ebola free. So SVHC uses two treatment facilities that we will transfer any patient that may have suspected Ebola. The first one is the University of Vermont Medical Center, and the UVM Medical Center has been renamed from Fletcher Allen. In New Hampshire, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is, is where we're sending our patients if uh, UVM cannot take the patient. And then we are following all our established guidelines for the CDC. We are screening, isolating, and transferring patients only. We do not have the staff nor the equipment uh, to take care of an Ebola patient for the long term. So are we prepared? Despite the fact that Ebola is a dangerous virus, it can be stopped with following protocols and preventing infections. SVHC is continuously monitoring the CDC guidelines. So what is SVHC doing? As I mentioned, they were proactively a task force of 25 clinicians and administrators who helped to work behind the scenes to start our initiative in October of 2014, long before many hospitals and health systems did. So far, we've trained more than 400 staff and who have received Ebola education, and nearly 200 employees have had specific training in how to correctly apply the specialized protective gear. The protective equipment that we'll be using, as shown on the screen, are gloves, gowns and aprons, masks and respirators, and face shields. This is a picture of one of our nurses who is dressed in a standard isolation gown. She has two pairs of gloves on, she has a mask, and she has a face shield. And this is, this is the, 
uh, the dress that will be used in our medical practices should a patient be ruled in as a suspected Ebola patient while waiting for the ER staff to arrive. Once the ER arrive, you'll notice that they are in a Tyvek type of suit. And the reason for the difference in the suit is that the ER staff will be providing direct patient care to the patient. Part of this process of putting the uh, equipment on and off includes an observer. Observers are important because they want, our goal is to make sure that there is no, no exposed skin anywhere that could be uh, potentially uh, exposed to the virus. As another update, we've had two successful drills, one in the emergency department and one in the medical practice division on November 7th and December 8th. We also have isolated three treatment rooms just off the emergency department which are designated for any potential Ebola patient. As you can see in the left side of your screen where the computers are, that entrance will actually be where the staff, the emergency department staff, will be putting on their protective attire and then going out through the, through the door on the second picture out into the area to provide care. If you look straight through the window of the first picture, you'll notice that there is a treatment room there and I've given you another picture here to show that there are three rooms in this area which also can be used. This is just another view of the same room. So in summary, direct contact with the infected patient's body fluid is the only way that you can get the Ebola virus. It is not airborne. It is not spread by contaminated food or water. It is not by mosquitoes or even sitting next to someone or by travel to any area other than West Africa. Thank you for watching this presentation on Ebola. Stay tuned for some upcoming segments on other medical issues as well. Should you need further information or you have any comments regarding this broadcast, feel free to contact me at the number on your screen. Thank you again.